Okay, yeah, thanks, sir. Uh, I'm not getting a big tire from the crowd. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to be a good job. 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 So, we think about this, um, just to remind people that the uh, intangible for our heritage is through our language. And we have sort of our cultural authority on our hands by speaking in the ancestral terminologies. We obviously need to speak in the language of the the uh, colonials and the invasion folk that came and brought English a global language to our country. But never forget, this is our language where we come from and the way we speak is like this. On that note, I uh, understand we've got many visitors from right across uh, Western Australia, from the Kimberley, from the Gilsa, from the Western Desert, from the South, and uh, from the Midwest, as well as in the South Coast. And uh, one and all, Family and friends, so uh, welcome to the Indian Welcome to Campus. So keep in mind that uh, the Welcome to Country um, is one of the uh, sort of oldest diplomatic uh, concepts in Australia, across the world. Uh, it just demonstrates to me, it's obvious that the unbroken traditions and connections to our laws and our uh, morals and our ethics is still in place. And hence, um, when, uh, when I was a little bloke uh, here in uh, Wycombe Valley, um, as grandfathers and grandmothers do, they raised the young ones, even though this faith, in fact, is not right, and they were intervening to take the family away because the grandparents raised the kids. Well, I lived in uh, a suburb called Wycombe Valley, which is east of here, um, not too far. And um, the thing about it was, uh, being brought up in the uh, 60s and the 70s, uh, kind of, um, it was an interesting time because uh, we were kind of still subject to hospital. Just from 1972, my parents weren't my legal guy. We're talking on the strange because I could tell who were the people 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 who were and the place you didn't really have with you was the Nunga Bukuru, I could read it all. The kid knows, you know, Nunga's and Nunga's. And uh, the family uh, was made sure through our language and cultural uh, uh, intelligence that we were always respectful to our family and our kin. Hence, uh, when I was, um, again, that little boat, my grandfather, I was Yellowfish, who was, um, was uh, uh, one of the old blokes that carried, carried the business uh, very, uh, Fair on his chest, and he often reminded me, grandson, one day in the future, when you become a man, you know, stand up in front of the crowd and say, I have your say. And as a part of that journey, uh, you need to make sure that you can speak and reflect our ancient narratives into the discourse of Australia. So, without further ado about the world in the country, uh, good to see us all here in uh, the town of Rio, in, in the post, uh, or nearly post uh, coronavirus scenario. So um, what I uh, just want to do is just set the context of where we've come today and what the time of year is. Um, for those uh, uh, might be aware, um, the campground is the time of the seasons that are here. But when, within that season, um, the manda, um, the manda is the gathering of the families and the groups that get together for trade and exchange, sharing knowledge, uh, maybe several old disputes and start new ones. Maybe meet your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your kids or in laws. And it's not surprising to me that the West Australian Heritage uh, Conference is held at the very beginning of the Monday, the gathering of the people that come to the local people. Never forget that, because this is where the heritage, as both intangible and tangible heritage, makes us Australians. The Australis, that is the southern territories, really talk back to the northern hemisphere about. Uh, that what we've got to say about heritage values and my own understanding of work with my colleague uh, 
the first event with them uh, with my sister Sandra, who was the other twin, and I was on the dial of the day. And um, so, you know, when we think about uh, this heritage stuff, um, uh, what I'll try to do in the overhead is to, um, is to in the very best I can, uh, speak in uh, West Australian or South West Australian. I'll try to speak English and I'll read the most of you. I couldn't understand what you know, I was talking about. And um, I know that, uh, you know, within Australia, we keep saying we speak Australian, but I don't think we do. I think we speak Australian, but I speak English. And in this part of the world, we speak South West Australian. And the idea that Aboriginal languages across the nation somehow are going down the um, pipe is absolutely untrue. Uh, from what I can see, the good of British, the young leaders are uh, up and coming. They are handling it all to the environment, chewing on the and the language that is our culture. Because they all serve, that that's the occasion of doing the knowledge power to move them to the direction of the future. So, um, the, the uh, title of our conversation, um, uh, Consultation Past, Present, Future, and Where to From Here. And we're going to do a sort of critical Nunga Yarn, and hopefully uh, other Aboriginal folk and, and uh, when I say Aboriginal folk, Australian Aborigines, I'm also talking to the Aborigines from the Gales and the Celts and other Aboriginal groups from the tribe, because I know too that we're all in one way or another been colonised by others. And what I'm saying is it's time for the, um, the to, to re um, engage our own uh, historical understanding. And so certainly the Aborigines of this country are absolutely going to be dependent to talk to the other Aborigines about their experiences in their country and talk about and the impacts around their heritage. And I think once we start to realise that the Northern Hemisphere is one of the process of playing the southern hemisphere, um, then we start to maybe um, disentangle some of the um, ambiguities about how we talk to each other and still talk with one another in racial terms, that being conducted or that being. Um, um, so I think that's a, a pretty good challenge for us. Um, I think race discourse is very destructive, uh, people misunderstand it. Um, and we have to get them to be able to of that narrative. But I think, um, you know, uh, in, the, in the heading, uh, uh, looking at a critical yarn, and what I mean by that is just reflecting, you know, uh, in real deep thinking about what's going on here, because um, we're all kind of uh, being contributions to the making of this inappropriate heritage conduct, as well as being victims of it. So I um, just want to talk through that. On the top uh, left hand side, you might notice a little tree, a little tree in the top. Um, Nungas, uh, we call that Nunga. Um, again, uh, for me personally, um, when I was born, uh, I was born in the time of the Mujalak, uh, that is the time of the Christmas tree. And for those people that might be from elsewhere, the West Australian Christmas tree, beautiful orange blossom, and I think it's coming in now. I know I spoke to some of the Folk from further east, and they said they're already in blossom. And down south, Harley, I think they're coming into blossom down that way in the Manang Bujara. And um, because I was born in, uh, on the 24th of December, 24th of December, 24th of December, is this working? This one, yeah. This one's not. It is. Hello, hello. Oh, okay, yeah. All right. Yeah. So uh, again, uh, just to set the context and understanding for uh, folk, uh, the Mujar is my totemic ancestor, my Burunka. Uh, when I was a, when I was born on the twenty fourth of December, obviously the Mujar is in full bloom. And when I uh, travelled in the motor car from um, Wycombe Valley out to Brook and Bingley, we often saw the Mujars. And when they came out, it was always, "Hey, there's Lenny's birthday tree." And uh, so um, when you see the Mujar. The awakening, you know, Lenny's babies there, along with lots of others. So, hence, I thought I'd put the tree in there um, just to remind one another. And um, just to reflect quickly, the Manda is where we are. That's where the meeting place goes on. It's in the time of the Cumberung, but in the specific thing, the Muja is the indicator for the business of the folks to gather together for trade and exchange and, and what we might describe as law business. So, uh, we're in the right time, and I think uh, whether or not the heritage organisers aware of that. Maybe that's one of the intangible influences in heritage that people don't know what they're doing or why they're doing it. They can't tell you, they can't necessarily feel it or know it, but it's the phenomena that the land speaks, the, the birds and the bees and everything else is speaking and talking. And even though people may not uh, 
necessarily understand or listen to it. They still do things, and hence uh, the, the um, gathering today. So I thought I'd uh, start off on the classic first slide, boat people. We've all heard about them boat people, haven't we? Who's a boat person? My ancestors were convicts and they came on too, so. So uh, the boat story um, doesn't start from the British, it starts from a whole bunch of other uh, nation states, but we're, we're uh, I guess, um, subjected to the construction from an Anglo-British bias and subjective position talking about 1829 when they discovered Australia in, in the West, and of course, 1770 in the East. The funny thing about it was Nungars and Mulvers and Yemenis and other Aboriginal folk know that there are other boats here way before the British. And so we need to um, take up the challenge to reject the narrative of the Anglos about they uh, construct the history according to their yarn. Well, that's not your yarn, that's our yarn. And so um, I think that, a framework of understanding starts to set the concepts and the principles which will drive this talk and I'm hoping it will drive other dialogues in the workshops. Um, so many and so many very interesting varied conversations. So um, so in a sense the uh, boat people come in, um, you know, uh, my pop uh, talked about the boat people. He said, he said the old Bennells, Baal Ninalang, Warden up, Baal Denanin, Nipia, um, um, on the boat, he said, these people, they belong to the boats, they come here. The whole Bennell said they seen them, they were watching them from the sand hills around Fremantle. So we're right here in the middle of this narrative where we're located. And uh, of course, um, this man here, he's obviously got something to say. And I think that's actually really quite tangible <clears throat> for the story today. Um, the story of uh, uh, people coming onto someone else's property without invitation, uh, taking uh, up residence in people's lands that they never got permission from and they still don't have permission. And so that whole old narrative of colonisation, uh, some people say, but I wasn't, uh, I, I, but I wasn't there. I, I didn't come on the boat. I, 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm not guilty of shooting and murdering any Aboriginals. And I didn't steal the land. People heard that young before, as I have. And I said, well, no, I'm not blaming you. And I don't want anybody to take blame for that because you're not to blame. But what I will say is somebody is taking advantage of stolen and resources from murdered people. And people are dealing with it every day. People have got uh, things in their lives, homes, houses, living on other people's stolen property and engaging in the process of that privilege. And I think that all Australians need to have a good, clear think about where to from here in relation to that. Don't deal with other people's property with the state of Western Australia, because they're an illegal entity. So the boat, so the boat yarn uh, fits beautifully with heritage, because in a sense still, the story of the boats dominates the narrative in colonised Australia. So um, from owners um, to outcasts, and uh, racism is the phenomena that drives the whole concept. Whether it's native title, it's around race. It's not about ownership in, in the classic genre of, uh, class, uh, of, uh, of, of the West and, and in, the, in the world of, um, of commerce and trade. At, uh, you know, the, if the people own the land, what, how come Aborigines are impoverished? What, why is it that some Aboriginal people haven't got two bob to wrap together? I mean, they're, they're not the working classes. They're not the middle classes. They are the bourgeois classes. They are the landholders. How come the bourgeois um, are telling the, you know, uh, telling the landowners um, that, uh, you know, they, this is how they got to work, this is what they got to do to live in this country. Uh, we got on fine and dandy for a long time in this country without anybody telling us how to do it. And we're still sort of stuck in that way, and we're stuck in that way because of the way the system operates, continually positioning the illegal state of Western Australia and the federal government as the boss of our country. They're not the boss of our country. We're the bosses of our country. Just go ask any one of the traditional owners in this room who's the bosses of their land. They'll tell you. But somewhere along the traps, the, um, this, this racism still, um, still dominates. I mean, I read heritage reports that were done in the 70s, gobsmacked how these people got away with the fake rubbish that they wrote in those reports. And for what was the end? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the end right result was. And there's lots of them. There's a plethora of them, and I suspect that it may well be people in this room that might even know the human beings that wrote those reports. Always leveraging to disassociate and alienate Nungas from their, 
their privileged rights and, their, and what their inheritances are. And I often use an example uh, to illustrate the concept of what I'm talking about. My ancestors on the Wagala side of the family came here as convicts. They were chained up and dehumanised on the boats that came to Australia. And I often say about this idea that someone else has done something and I've inherited the privilege. And I say, well, if my ancestor has stolen the Queen of England's crown and I happen to have it sitting on my uh, fireplace at home, do you reckon um, the English authorities would be knocking on my door asking where is the Queen's crown? Do you think? Oh, okay. So it's just a human thing, isn't it? If something's stolen, the owner wants it back. Hence, uh, in, in the very conservative position that Aboriginal is saying, please, you took our land, you took our bloody kids, you took a lot of stuff, we just want you to hand it back, no problem. And so I think for, um, for the conversation for the rest of this day, I'm sure that that's going to be at the cutting edge and maybe JJ's um, um, uh, inference to, you know, people are passionate, passionate and I'm sure the Irish know all about the, the um, colonial processes up there. So uh, what, I, what I did, uh, had a yarn with Ben and Sandra and we saw, you know, we, we could write a paper and we could have all the words up and I could write, read the words verbatim and bore you to tears. But um, Sandra and uh, Ben said, no, no, we'll just use some, some images and we'll talk to the points. So the thing is, uh, we, we can see here, there's a couple of pictures of uh, some, uh, some folk, ma mainly Noongars, and uh, I apologise uh, for, for not necessarily mentioning other areas elsewhere but I just want to focus at home but I think some of the concepts and the principles and the ideas that I talk about are, are globally applicable um, and so uh, the focus of my dialogue is, is really about um, uh, certainly here in, in Perth but uh, in the southwest and, and obviously it'll look at uh, statewide and, and a little bit about uh, national and, and international things. But um, we all uh, uh, think about uh, Perth as a very liberal uh, place, you know, an, an open democracy, lots of goodies here for people to work hard and all that sort of thing. And just to remind folk, this racism stuff, um, uh, basically our people couldn't even go into the city. And uh, of course, if you were, uh, many people can talk about to their family um, being arrested and so forth. The options, of course, the racism or the races which governed over Perth are finished. If you ask any young person, any young long guys or yamages that come to Perth and ask them about, do you think the race acts changed? Do you think the coppers allow people just to walk around in town without harassment? Um, I think that um, whilst the acts are gone, the attitudes and the values and the practices are well ensconced in, in the folk that um, um, control uh, Perth. Not, not just the monarchs anymore, but you've got all these other, you know, rail guards and uh, rangers and goodness knows uh, what else. So the, um, the uh, prohibitation area, uh, basically speaking, if, um, if you were caught in that area, back, back between that period, you'd be arrested. And what was the uh, crime that you committed? Anybody can guess what the crime is? You just happen to be an Aborigine in a place where you're not supposed to be. So that's all you needed to be arrested. Um, during the uh, 60s and 70s, as a young uh, young young fellow living in Wycom Valley, um, there was lots of stuff on TV, a lot of stuff on TV, on that black and white TV, we used to watch it. And um, of course, uh, in our family, uh, my mum and dad, they were heavily involved in the activism around, uh, you know, getting uh, resources for uh, homeless um, fellows and whatnot. And um, whilst we weren't in Canberra, Canberra's a long way, we didn't even know where it was, and um, didn't maybe necessarily go to the pretty black activism stuff, uh, we were well, um, uh, versed in the dialogues through our parents talking about what was going on and particularly uh, through um, the Aboriginal Advancement Council in Perth, um, people like uh, Jack Davis and um, you know, many others are involved in that, that uh, work up there. So I mean these are things which, which uh, we were alive but we were a bit young, we weren't probably totally um, familiar with what was going on but all we knew was that in our, in our minds we, we knew that there was something wrong going on because if, as far as we'd always been raised, we're Noongars, this is our lands. And uh, so this, the complex stuff that um, Whitlam was involved in, you know, the, the handing over the sand and other things was all, all there. And, and um, you know, when I talked to uh, some of the, the, the folk that ran at that time, it was really exciting, complex and challenging. Um, but when I all thought that they were getting to a stage where there was going to be good things happening, there always seemed to be a negative spin to it.
So um, apartheid, from what I can gather of, I mean, South Africa, I think they're supposed to be the apartheid kings of the world or queens. Uh, from what I can understand, um, Western Australia sent our acts and our apartheid laws to them to teach them how to do it. At least in Africa, if you're a black, you knew where you stood, even though you didn't like it, it was wrong. In Australia, you didn't know where you stood. If you were black, you didn't know if you were white, you didn't know if you were brown, you didn't have rights, or you didn't. And hence, um, the ambiguity of, of the, the way our people were treated was basically the same as Africa, but um, uh, caused a little bit of confusion. So by the uh, 70s, from what I can uh, tell of it, um, having read some of the literature, listened to people conversing and that, um, there was obviously a lot of lobbying at places like um, up, up in the um, up in the beer there, uh, around the bottom of uh, Cart Jenning in Bow or Kings Park, where there's a lot of activism going there. Um, uh, and so, from what I can tell of it, the government decided they needed to legislate it. If you want to control something, what do you do? You legislate it. And hence, uh, uh, these acts were put together. And um, it's and it's really it's still there. I mean, the current minister um, he's basically inherited the the um, the poison chalice of this act. And um, they try to keep telling us that it's a good act. And I, I keep saying, well, why don't you get an act? Get an act with a decent act, because the act that you've got now is pretty poor. And it really doesn't deliver much to Noongars and other Aboriginal folk um, around the state. And uh, what I came to realise is, um, as a young bloke uh, at, at, the, at the university with Michelle Roon, where's Michelle there? She's over there. And, uh, and others that are in the room. And um, I used to watch um, Clayton Lewis playing footy for, um, uh, for uh, Clement at the time. And um, I used to read this stuff. And one, and one of the ironies of it is that we were training in different disciplines to learn how to critique, um, critique things or get to know how to break it down and make sense of it. And one of the uh, challenges um, was is that um, being a young Noongar, I uh, somehow I got indulged in the discipline of um, Marxist critique. And... Um, and I thought, what the hell, I'll be a Marxist? I mean, what will my Russian wife say? <laughs> and uh, anyway, what I realised is actually you don't have to be a, like a classic bloody Marx. You just use it as a tool of review and critique. And hence, um, I used to get into some pretty complex conversations with my colleagues at uni. And some people said, Lenny, you're a pretty, <laughs> you're a pretty revolutionary guy, mate. What you're saying is that a lot of people won't like what you've got to say. And the point was is that I kind of evolved this idea that the government um, funds things. And so uh, during the 70s, when a lot of the Aboriginal organisations set up the medical, legal, um, other agencies and, you know, land council, or not land councils, but whatever they were, the, they had to be uh, incorporated under the Aborigines uh, Act. And so we thought we'd got rid of this, um, uh, this law, but it's still there. Um, it's still operating, this Race Act in Australia. And so uh, what I, uh, when I was doing my study, I, I was looking at the way government controls um, society. And one of the things I realised that what was going on, every time the government funded an Aboriginal organisation, we thought we were getting self-determination. But in actual fact, we were a subservient to the institutions of governance. We become a servant of the state. The state funds us, they give us the dough to go and do things. And so when we talk about the idea of self-determination or whatever, we actually weren't engaged in self-determination. What we're engaged in is we're engaged in servitude to the state. And a lot of our people don't, still don't realise that. So you take money from the government, well, then basically uh, they're telling you to cut my lawn this high and make it good. And if you don't, well, then we're going to defund you. Has anybody experienced that? Yeah, I think we've all probably had that experience. And so as I thought about it more, I thought, well, how come our people think by what we're doing, that's a good thing? Because I think it was. But the, but the catch always was, was that we're always dependent, dependent on government handouts, not necessarily as welfare, but funding for our organisations and our agencies. And so the government set up the parameters around what and how Indigenous agents should operate into the future, under their control, under their conditions, under their dictation, and under their rules of engagement. And so uh, the things like... Um, um, I mean, even still today, whether it's legal service or medical service, we read on there, you know, Aboriginal self-determination. I keep saying, well, will you tell me how it's our self-determination? What it is is actually self-welfare dependency. That's what's gone on. So the thing about it was, um, you know, they were pretty complex discussions. And obviously, you know, as young fellas, um, some people kind of um, got offended by what I was saying because, I mean, what I was learning was, was to learn to critique Western systems. 
that's what I was learning. And it was a bit like the lady when I first went to uni. She said, oh, you've come here to learn about your people, have you? And being a young cheeky nung, I said, what are you talking about? I don't know my people. I come here to study you people because I want to find out what the hell makes you tick. So uh, hence I, um, I um, used to study and observe the behaviours of white fellows and see what they're up to. Still doing it, I think. Yeah, so the, uh, by, by the 70s, um, I, and, and there's lots of people in the room, I'm sure, all part of that, um, that, that, um, that innovation into the future about setting up the organisations, getting the funds and, and getting moving forward. And I'm not saying there wasn't a lot of absolutely outstanding innovative work. Um, absolutely, a lot of heroes in our families right across the state that did that. Um, but um, uh, with the new Heritage Acts and whatnot, um, well, we've got to have some new ideas to think about and how we do it. Uh, yeah, so the ACMC, again, it's a classic apparatus of control. Um, the uh, Aboriginal Cultural Materials um, Committee, is that what it is? Yeah. So again, uh, when you actually read the thing, it's about people um, either being nominated by the state or you can put forward a, uh, an application to be considered to be a, uh, a member of the, of the committee. Again, um, who, who uh, tells the Aboriginal people can sit on the committee? Anybody can guess? The state does. And the minister has the last say. So you could be a really outstanding, innovative revolutionary with all bright ideas. And you could say, I want to get onto the committee to change the whole word and the earth and the universe. And I would imagine that you probably be quickly your, your uh, proposal might go from the left hand side of the table to the right hand, and then they just keep going. And so to me, I think my observation was that the state was looking to find people who were cognizant and amenable and manipulative to fit onto the committee to do what they were told and sign off on very complex and challenging legislation. And I, um, I believe that's what was going on. And good people, you know, really good people, no problem, but people I don't really think that they fully were cognizant about what they were being set up to do. And the role of, of, of people um, that are used by government, I think in the old days, the black trackers, and the fact of the matter is, I think we've all got family members that are black trackers, irrespective of what. And that's something that we, as Aboriginal people, have to own up to. Um, because um, you know our people are manipulated by police or, and the, uh, that system to do a job for the state. And hence, there's lots of horror tales about black trackers. And so in a sense, um, that my critique and observation is, is the state continues to set up these apparatuses to do the black tracking or to, do the, to, do, to get other Aboriginal people to do the job of the state. So we've got the Aboriginal Advisory Committee. Yeah. It's not just us white folks. It's, it's, it's new Aboriginal people said that that's what they wanted. And so this is the, the continual sustained model of heritage state acts and the way the apparatuses of control and manipulation over our heritage sites uh, continues to this very day. And I suspect that it will go on tomorrow. But somewhere along the traps, the heritage community and uh, the traditional owners and others need to get there and say, hey, it's high time now that we started acting like a mature nation and started, started taking responsibility like other Aboriginal nations around the world and not to be continue to be subjected to manipulation by foreign powers and foreign governments still today have not secured any treaty treaty with anybody on this country. And so in, in technically speaking, if that is the case, well technically we're still at war because this is a this nation state is still in a state of war. You only got to go to the prisons to see how many of our people are still locked up. Um, and the whole thing about uh, the social indicators, we are being impoverished and continually uh, um, um, uh, beaten up by the alleged best practice acts of the state. Yeah, they're the best practice, mate. They've got people in jail at premium numbers and doing a fantastic job, if you understand what I'm saying, because they're not as horrible. So um, in the 80s, uh, by then, uh, where are we in the 80s? 82, I think uh, I think I was down Bunbury there um, playing footy. Um, Clay, you were down there too, playing footy for the Bunbury Bulldogs against the um, uh, South Bunbury Tigers, I think it was. Um, around about that period. And at that time, there was a lot of uh, activism. I'm sure most people would probably be familiar with um, what was going on here and certainly in the in the Bijara, in the Bijara, the, the, the riverlands here in the Wajat country. There was a hell, hell of a lot of stuff going on about sites. And uh, the, the OVEDs we're using here is to do with the um, Kat Jenning and Bow site. 
um, otherwise known inappropriately as King's Park. It's not King's Park at all, it's our park. We might as well change it to Noongar Park next week as a part of uh, reflection. And uh, the thing about it, there's lots of uh, deep, um, deep connections to that site, you know, without going to say uh, plenty of business goes on there. Um, and of course, um, uh, the sacred waters uh, that, the, uh, that ended up being used by the grog system to siphon up our sacred waters, turn it into alcohol to poison our people and others. Again, a classic example of going to a heritage site, disrespecting it to the, to the, to the nth degree, turn it into a grog shop and selling it to poison our people. Mind you, I don't mind a beer every now and again either, so don't get me wrong. Um, it can be quite sweet after a hot day. That, that nectar. But um, so, uh, you know, here, here's a, a lot of uh, really important and powerful work went on. And um, so in, in the period 70 to 80s, and under the Aboriginal Heritage Act, it's, it's actually quite an interesting phenomena, which I'll get on to a second. But I just wanted to um, show you a couple, of the, a couple of the slides. Who was there, anybody? Put your hand up if you are there. Cheap as money. Oh, okay, there was one person there. Um, yeah. So what happened was under this heritage um, model uh, and the activists, they uh, beat the hell out of the state. So eventually I think the state said, right, we've got to set up an apparatus of control. And so therefore we'll set up the Aboriginal Heritage Act 1972. And it's ironical, that still today, that Heritage Act has some legs. For example, uh, the activists, um, some of them were Noongar families, TOs, some of them weren't. And so there was a deal struck between the state um, that they would have a, uh, have, have a new act. And in the act, there was a group of peoples whose names were put down. And when you did any heritage work in and around the Wajak Wujara, my ancestral lands and other people in this room, there's lots of them, how are you all? Um, our people were superseded by a group of activists. How did, how did that happen? Traditional loan has been superseded by activists, that is people that go and do really hard work, pretty cool, you know, argy-bargy, they get beaten up by the cops, they get hunted and left, right and centre, so we, so, we, so we want to make sure that those people should be acknowledged to the very highest thanks and, and outstanding work that they did. But in the process, their names suddenly are on the list of go-to heritage um, uh, experts that you've got to go and talk to. And of course, there was a lot of argy-bargy between the fact and the family, but what you know, Lenny Cole and his family, you know, for me, he's best run along and go back to where he come from because the real deal people is, is, is the Bennells and the, and the, the Maguires and, and the Jacobs and, and, and they're the families that come from me, not these other ones. And I'm sure that that still resonates today. The people are still quite unsure exactly who are the bosses that we should talk to, which I think is part of our ongoing problem. We've got absolute global experts here in this part of the world and some of their practice I think is really poor. Personally, I think it's very poor and uh, they need to pull their socks up. So the thing about it is, is um, the old brown paper bag. Anybody ever come across someone with a brown paper bag? Come on, put your hand up. Of course we have. And it's really quite a, a nice feeling when they hand over the plastic bag and you, and you get it and you, and you open it. And, um, and I was telling my colleague, I actually got an email yesterday for you, got cash for you, ready to go, and I'm going, oh my goodness. So, um, allegedly, there's, there's, all myth, there's all myth and merriment about this concept, whether it was true or false, no one, I don't think everyone really, it's one of those intangibles, really. People heard about it, they know about it, but they can't actually see it, they never taste it, they never saw it, nobody ever saw the brown paper bag or its contents. But we know that in the bag there was um, a commodity called moolah, or boya, or dollars. And it doesn't matter where you go in the world, the money seems to be the oil to make cogs go around. And so uh, for a long time, we were aware of the dialogues of parents about uh, blah, 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 you know, 5,000 or 10,000, someone got 1,000 or whatever it was. And I uh, named people, you know, named them left, right and centre. So but whether or not my oldies were uh, in the know, um, who, who was uh, given the dog and who wasn't, Mainly uh, heritage fellows were handing money over. But who's done that? Put your if you're one of those heritage people who have done that. Now remember, <laughs> and remember, uh, people work in places where there's ethical and moral conduct that's under the gaze. So if you've been involved in the past, we might have a truth, we might need to have a truth, a truth commission where we can have people come forward and say, I've done nothing to please And I'm not joking. 
If you think I'm joking, I'm not. Because uh, us Noongars, we're very serious people, and I know other folk around the track, they're very serious people too. And rest of it, you can quote me on it, okay? You can quote me on it. So the thing about it is that there's some examples there, um, and, and as I say again, it's just talking about sort of mainly Wajda stuff, but I'm suspected if I did go around under the invitation of other TOs elsewhere, to say, Lenny, can you come have a bit of a look around and invite me to do that? I'm sure I'd find names, I could find companies, and probably people in this room that have been um, engaged in that kind of stuff. The thing about it is um, the, the three big uh, things that happened in the, in the 70s and 80s, I think the Marble decision really um, um, cranked it up. Uh, the wick lit the fuse and the Noongar just folded it up. And the difference between the first two, Marbo and Wick, they're remote area folk uh, living on their lands, undisturbed, going about their business like they had done for the last 100,000 years. The big difference was the Noongars. Hmm, Noongars. Aren't they them city fellas? Ain't they them fellas that lost their culture? They lost their land, they lost their language, they lost their way. And the irony was, is I, I as a Noongar couldn't even recognise myself. These large people talking about me. Oh, you, you, you mob lost your land. You lost, you, you lost your language, you lost your law, you lost your culture. And I say, well, that's interesting. So who told you that? Oh, well, you know, uh, I, I talked to uh, uh, Billy from Stolen Generations. Oh, okay, so Stolen Generations know about the followed stuff with the people and learn their language and their and their ethics and morality. And so, um, you know, uh, the, 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 I think the Noongar one is, is, I think, one of the early ones in the city where um, when they spoke to the justice or whoever it was at that time, from what I can remember, the Noongars only spoke to him in Noongar, and so he couldn't engage with them. Oh, brilliant. You understand what we're saying? You join our lands? You're the representative of the foreign government. You can't even speak to us in our language. I think you better run along and tell the government that this is indeed the Noongar views, and we've never lost contact or connection to anything except in the minds of those that want to construct inappropriate conversations about us until, until Boulevard did rally up people. Boulevard did, that's a new word, I think. Anyone know what Boulevard is? Michelle, you're from New Zealand. No, don't answer me, don't answer me. That's another, that's another heritage. Now. So, um, uh, obviously, um, you know, it was in the newspapers, Fed's talking to states, you know, states talking to, um, uh, engagement at the local level through um, whatever apparatuses they have. But always in, in the conversation, Noongars are still talking, walking my country, as my ancestors did, to look with your eyes, to taste our culture, to listen to our language, to smell our heritage. So Noongars just continue the narrative. We're not interested in, in um, conforming to other people's imagination. If you want to imagine something, go right ahead. But don't imagine and, and disrespect me. And but hopefully uh, other people might pick you up and tell you that you're out of order in this country. Your behaviour is acceptable. So, um, from Wadula Consultants, um, Wadula Consultants really controlled and controlled find the, uh, the, the, the um, sort of privileged families. Um, some of them were TOs and some of them were activists who you're supposed to go to to get the thumbs up and the big kick. Make sure you take the brown bag with you or something in it to make sure you look after them. And so they crank, they crank, crank up these, um, these reports and uh, obviously um, part of the work that I am involved in um, in heritage studies at UWA and, and other um, work that I've done, we'd have to read these things. And again, I was gobsmacked as a young lad reading these reports by people that allegedly were the experts in, in understanding and appreciating and engaging in, with Noongar people. 
allegedly the Antros, or whoever they were, Arkies or somebody. And they wrote these reports that continually, the, the, the central message was that we are the ultimate lords and of understanding on behalf of the people. And those, those little Aboriginal, where they come to through the Antros. And that's in fact the state is set in policy that uh, you must Antros as the go-to people when you talk about Aboriginal things. The thing about it is how many Antros have got in the room? Now, okay, um, how many of those Antros can speak um, St. Yunga? Put your hand up. How many of those Antros can speak Yamaji? Or Wangai? Or Malba? I think we've got a bit of work to do, peeps. And uh, I think for the folk around the traps, one of the key matters is now um, is if people want to come and work in your land, you start talking to them in your land, so they can't speak to you. Next, next, next. And when you get to the deadline, no, no more left. I think we'll know where we stand. Because uh, if people have been living and operating here in WA at least, for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and cannot speak in any one of the plethora of local languages, that tells you how much disrespect is going on. And uh, I think if people are guilty of being disrespectful, I think you've got a bit of work to do to pull your socks up and do something about it. And that's not the responsibility of Aboriginal people, that's your responsibility. And if you don't want to learn to communicate with people with their language, it's best you go and find something else to do. Talked a little bit already about the handshake deals. Um, now this one here was a quote out of, out of the report and <laughs> I said to my colleagues uh, and, and my sister, I said, I think we better edit the names off of there because um, obviously, uh, you know, pe uh, people's names come up about the families, but I'm, I'm not here to, to uh, comment what their names are. But all I'm saying, it was a quote from, from the report on the right hand side. And it was an informant, um, uh, uh, a Noongar Wajak man that was saying, well, Lenny, um, when he was interviewed recently, well, yeah, we've got a problem because there's other fellows that are claiming rights over, over the Swan River lands, and I'm sure there's others doing it elsewhere that don't have the right um, to do that. And at the end of the day, we, as the bosses in our own, own country, need to have, have to take the responsibility to engage us and do something about it. So 45 minutes uh, goes very quickly, and I've already got the card to finish her up. So I'm just going to go through it um, to say that there's the rise and the rise of Noongar heritage owners. You can quote me on it, but in the future model will be if any heritage work needs to be done, entry, socios or whatever, you go and find yourself a Noongar uh, business and you uh, ask them to be a joint um, uh, collaborator in their business and we're going to switch it around because no longer will heritage come to be telling Aboriginal people to come and work for us. So that's a clear message. So if you've been doing it the other way around, you better change the behaviour. Because I think we're going. I think there was talk around. Just I don't know if it's true or not. But I understand there's a list being set up for companies and individuals to be put on, and your name might end up on it. So just be aware of that. Um, MetroNet is another one which we won't talk about. But we'll just move on to to the end. Uh, there's there's uh, tr traditional owner groups getting back together. Families are getting back and realising. Yep, we've got to go back to the old responsible way of speaking to one another and, and engaging each other. Uh, in better behaviour sort of being played off by one another by other um, stakeholders. And uh, Rotness is coming up and I know Ezra Jacobs, young Ezra, is uh, one of the Buddha Buddhas. He's one of the future leaders and, and leading on that front. We want to say well done to the grandson for that. And um, where to from here? Well, that's where we are, aren't we? Where to from here? And uh, Buddha Nunuk Karidinitja Buddha, or will you know this land later on? And uh, this is a picture uh, drawn by my Muni uh, Barry Barry Maguire, and it really is an old one there with the Red Coast. When they came to talk to the Noongars, they knew, as did many of the Dutch and other foreigners, they came to, to find and catch an Aborigine to be the guides on their journeys. So on that note, um, as the Noongars always say, or we'll see you later on. Thank you.